about 10 years ago, Senator Robert Byrd added a rider to a bill that required colleges and universities that receive federal aid to commemorate the Constitution in some meaningful way. Today's event, coming almost 226 years after the Constitution was signed, on September 17, 1787, gives us a chance to not only fulfill the federal mandate, but also to deepen our understanding of this founding document. To this end, I have invited Dr. Michael Zucker, the Nancy R. Drew Professor of Political Science at Notre Dame, who will present a paper titled, Slavery at the Constitutional Convention. As Dr. Watson mentioned, there will be time after the presentation for some questions. You're free to stand up, project loudly, and make your question known at the time. Dr. Zucker is a noted authority on the Constitution and has an extensive publication record, so I will not enumerate all of his accomplishments here. Let me just mention a few, though. He is the author of The Natural Rights Republic that appeared in 1996, Launching Liberalism in 2002, The Truth About Leo Strauss, which is co-written with Catherine Zucker in 2006, and he's currently completing The Natural Rights and the new constitutionalism slated to appear next year. On behalf of Holy Cross, Student Life, the History Department, and Delta Epsilon Sigma, please help me to welcome Dr. Michael Zucker. You might not have noticed, but um, this year we are celebrating the 225th anniversary of the startup of the Constitution under uh, start with the new government, I should say, under the new constitution. Um, it just is the case that 225th anniversaries are just not very often taken much notice of. This is in marked contrast to the 200th anniversary in 1987 of the Constitutional Convention. That was something else. Um, I know that few of you in this room were alive then. I suspect actually very few of you in this room were alive then, but take my word for it, it was big. Um, Chief Justice Warren Burger of the U.S. Supreme Court was even appointed the head of something called the U.S. Commission on the Bicentennial, and his job in that capacity was to encourage events to celebrate the Bicentennial, and he even authorized a special seal to be affixed to all projects and activities that were officially approved by that Bicentennial Commission. Now, there was one activity that year, though, that I do not think got the Bicentennial seal of approval. And that was a speech by Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall. This was a speech he gave before the noted constitutional body, the San Francisco Patent and Trademark Association, which was meeting in all places in Maui, Hawaii. Um, in any case, Berger, who was one of the most conservative justices on the court, and Marshall, who was one of the most liberal justice on, justices on the court, had clashed many times before, but this particular disagreement between them caught the attention of the entire public. Because rather than enjoining in Rather than joining in the celebration of the founders that Justice Berger was supporting, Justice Marshall, in his speech, announced right off that he did not find the wisdom, foresight, and sense of justice exhibited by the framers particularly profound. Now, the issue that led Justice Marshall to this dissenting view was slavery. Many saw it to be just a little bit indelicate for Justice Marshall to raise this issue at this moment of celebration all around the country. But nonetheless, that issue had been on the mind of historians, constitutional scholars, many citizens for quite a long time. And indeed, around it had developed two academic factions, if you will, sometimes known as Neo-Lincolnians and <coughs> Neo-Garrisonians. The latter, the Neo-Garrisonians were named for the great 19th century abolitionist uh, activist and thinker William Lloyd Garrison, who had condemned the Constitution as a covenant with death and an agreement with hell because of its support for slavery. The other group was named, as you might have guessed, for Abraham Lincoln, who had a very different understanding of the Constitution. <coughs> 
Now, this is not the place to relate in any detail the various debates over the founders and slavery. But I think I need to give just a brief summary that will be useful for us. As far as I can see, the debates concern two main issues. One issue was how favorable was the Constitution towards slavery? And the other one was what were the motives upon which the founders were acting when they acted with regard to slavery? Now, the Neo-Garrisonians answered that first question in a very straightforward way. The Constitution was very favorable to the institution of slavery, gave it a great deal of life-sustaining aid, and stamped it with the moral seal of approval. The Neo-Lincolnians, on the other hand, conceded that the Constitution did make some accommodations to slavery, but they denied that they, they were nearly as substantial as the Neo-Garrisonians said, and they were particularly eager to deny that the Constitution stamped the institution of slavery with anything like a seal of moral legitimacy. The Neo-Garrisonians answer this, the other question, the second question about the motives upon which the founders were acting, um, by pointing to the same complex of motives that had led to the establishment and flourishing of slavery in the first place. Not a pretty list. Greed, racism, Christian triumphalism, moral indifference. These were the main items in their list of <coughs> motives. The Neo-Lincolnians, however, emphasized the place of slavery in the constitutional order as due primarily to the press of necessity. Without concessions to slavery, they said, the union would not have been possible. The Neo-Lincolnians frequently point to the expectation, or at least the hope, among the founders that the process of abolition of slavery, which had begun in the states, in some of the states anyway, after the revolution, would continue until slavery had been driven from the land. Now these scholarly debates on slavery can be very heated. The topic, in fact, is so controversial that the partisans of, different, of the different positions cannot even agree about how many, how many parts of the Constitution are relevant to slavery. One Neo-Garrisonian found that there are 18 clauses, 18 clauses directly or indirectly supportive of slavery in the Constitution. The Neo-Lincolnians find far fewer, only three as a matter of fact, the so-called three-fifths formula for representation and taxation, the slave trade clause, and the fugitive slave clause. Now, these three clauses are going to be important for the rest of my talk, so I want to take a moment to explain briefly what they are, proceeding on the assumption that not all of you have memorized the Constitution. Now, the formulas for representation and direct taxes provided that each state would have seats in the House of Representatives in proportion to its number of free persons and then three-fifths of the number of all other persons. That was a roundabout way of referring to the slaves. And so far as there were to be direct taxes, these were going to be apportioned among the states according to that same formula. So the slave states would thus get, a, you might say, a bonus in representation for the slaves, but they would also pay more taxes on account of the slaves than they might have if the slaves weren't counted at all. As it turned out, direct taxes were not levied, so the three-fifths formula ended up just being a representational bonus for the slave states. So that's the first, the formula of representation. Secondly, the slave trade clause. This clause denied Congress the power to prohibit the slave trade until 1808. That is to say, 20 years after the new Constitution would go into effect. The Fugitive Slave Clause provided, in again, very roundabout language, which we'll talk about, that a slave escaping from one state into another shall not become free by virtue of getting into that other state, but instead shall be, as they say in the clause, delivered up. <clears throat> now today, I want to go beyond the neo this debate between Neo-Gersonians and Neo-Lincolnians and put forward a different account of slavery in the Constitutional Convention and in the Constitution than they do.
Now, it seems to me that both the neo-Lincolnians and the neo-Garrisonians go astray in their efforts to understand the place of slavery at the convention and in the Constitution, and in their attempt to understand the motives of the people at the convention, in part because they do not set the convention properly into its historical context. The historical circumstances in place at the time of the convention were very different from the later history of slavery in America. And it was those, that different context that set the expectations of members of the founding generation, not what later happened. But today, today when we think back to the problem of slavery at the Constitutional Convention, we too of, often think as if the later history set the context for what they were doing there, but it did not. Now, paradoxically, achieving clarity on the later history is perhaps even more important than getting clarity on the context in which they were operating. So I'm going to begin with that and then move back to the other. The post-history, that is the history of slavery in America after the Constitutional Convention, saw a real transformation of the slave system in America. In the period around the time of the Constitutional Convention, the main use of slave labor, as you may know, was to cultivate tobacco in the Upper South and rice in the Lower South. But starting in the 1790s, the Southern economy uh, shifted to cotton. And there were two technological bases for that shift. First was the development of steam technology, which then led to the development of, me of a mechanized textile industry in Britain. This resulted in the factory production of cotton cloth, which predictably led to a greatly increased demand for raw cotton. The second technological factor driving this transformation of the southern economy and thereby of the slavery system was the famous cotton gin. Now the cotton gin allowed the relatively inexpensive separation of cotton fiber from the cotton seeds a process which had great implications for the American South because the kind of cotton that grew readily in America was a kind of cotton that had actually seeds that were very difficult to separate from the uh, fiber without the cotton gin. That fact limited the feasibility of cotton production in the South before the cotton gin. With the cotton gin, cotton became an economically viable crop. With the ever-increasing demand for raw cotton, it became an economically lucrative crop. Now the difference that cotton production made after the Constitutional Convention is readily visible in a few basic statistics. Now don't everybody go to sleep here because you'll want to absorb these. There won't be too many of them, and they're simple ones. In 1790, which is roughly at the time of the Constitutional Convention, the US produced total 3,000 bales of cotton. Remember that number, 3,000. In 20 years, that figure increased 60-fold. And by 1858, on the eve of the Civil War, cotton production stood at 4 million bales, from 3,000 to 4 million. That is an increase of more than 1,000 times the amount of cotton from the time of the uh, Constitutional Convention. Cotton became, as you might imagine, the leading American export. And the dollar value of cotton was greater than that of all other American exports combined. That the slave system that produced this cotton would be importantly changed and elevated in importance should not therefore come as a surprise. But we cannot read back from that history of what did happen to cotton, and thus to slavery after 1790, to the expectations and plans of the men who wrote the Constitution. That future was completely opaque and unexpected to them. Instead, the way they looked at it, the context they faced, they saw a history and a trajectory of slavery in America that was quite different before 1787. Of course, as, as you may know, um, 
By the mid-18th century, slavery was very well established in the North American continent. At the time of the start of the revolution, it existed in all 13 colonies. It was very well established also in French and Spanish possessions in the Americas. In 1750, according to the best estimates, about 20% of the population of what would become the US were blacks, most of whom were slaves. But that population was very unevenly distributed throughout the country. In the North, less than 5% of the population was black, and in the South, on average, about 40% was, with a high of 60% in South Carolina. But the situation of slavery in, the America, in America, in this part, US, was much affected by the American Revolution. <clears throat> a combination of events and trends set slavery back, substantially back in those years. The British, for example, during the Revolutionary War, offered freedom to slaves in the South who would fight for them, and some took up that offer. Others used the opportunity of wartime chaos to escape. Moreover, in a movement that one historian has called the contagion of liberty, all the northern states abolished slavery in the years after the Revolution. Individual voluntary manumission, freeing of individual slaves, was also occurring and state laws were passed, even in the South, making that easier and easier to do. In 1787, Congress, under the Articles of Confederation, passed the Northwest Ordinance, prohibiting slavery in the Northwest Territory, which includes the present states of Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, and Wisconsin, no small amount of territory. All of these developments produce an increase in the number of free blacks in both North and South. In 1790, 8% of all blacks in the US were free. By 1810, 14% were free. Conversely, the number of slaves